Și eu, mulțumesc. Bună seara, bine ați venit. Mulțumim, Alex, pentru introducere. Mulțumim Muzeul Național de Altă Contemporană pentru găzduire și Asociația Accept pentru organizare. Aș vrea să le mulțumesc și voluntarilor care au ajutat la organizarea acestei expoziții. Mulțumim, dragilor! Um, o să continuăm de la un punct încolo în engleză și aș vrea să vă întreb dacă are nevoie cineva de traducere. Să ridice mâna, vă rog! Ce bine! Înseamnă că nu o să traduc, o să purtăm discuția în engleză. So I will turn to English now. <laughs> Good evening! Thank you, Alexander, for being here. Uh, it's a great honor uh, not only to be hosting this conversation, but also to be part of your project. <laughs> uh, welcome. Um, okay. Hello. So uh, I would like, I would kindly like to ask everybody to keep the distance and their masks on during the whole conversation. We will be talking about 30 minutes, maybe 45, as long as it will take. And then uh, we will uh, give the microphone to the public to open the discussion for you to ask your questions. Uh, welcome. Thank uh, you. Uh, it's good to see you again. It's been a year. Uh, please, I would like to ask you firstly, um, how come? How come this project, you are the creator and photographer of Transbalkan, uh, how did you come up with this idea? Buonasera, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for making this possible. I know it's been a crazy year for everybody and I very much appreciate you guys organizing this. Um, the last time I was in uh, Bucharest was last November, which is when I came to, to meet you and to meet all the wonderful people other people who are part of this project from Romania. Um, the inspiration for doing this project, uh, I didn't wake up one day and just decide this is what I'm going to do. It was a process. It had to do with um, meeting trans people in my own personal life and back home in Serbia and re realizing the struggles uh, that they're going through daily. So the, the, it, was, it was very personal for me because they're my friends and I realized that there is a story here which is not being told. Uh, now I'm talking personally about Serbia. Two, three years back in Serbia there was really almost zero visibility for the trans community. So I felt like uh, this was a story that was just waiting to be told. And um, I started photographing first my friends who are trans Um, in particular, there is one person, I believe her portrait, yeah, her portrait is right here. Her name is Helena, and she is, let's say, she's the equivalent of you, Patrick, in Serbia. She was the first person who came out publicly, uh, and that really made an impact for me. And after meeting her and becoming friends, I just realized that this was a... Uh, I almost felt a duty because I couldn't believe that these stories were not being told. So it wasn't a, a one day decision, it was a process. Uh, initially, as you can read here, the, port, the, the project was concentrated only on the region of ex-Yugoslavia, so the six countries, plus Kosovo, seven. Um, and then I realized that I should cover all of the Balkans, which includes, of course, you know, Bulgaria, Romania, Greece, Albania. Um, But you extended to 12 countries. I include But 30. <laughs> <laughs> But before we get to the traveling part mm -hmm. and researching other areas of mm -hmm. the Balkans, I want to ask you kindly to present yourself. Sure. And who, who are you, Alexander? Sure. <laughs> and what entitles you to this project? <laughs> uh, my name is Alexander, Alexander Cernogorets. I am originally from Serbia. I'm a documentary photographer, I studied political science, and uh, mostly I worked in fashion my whole life, because documentary photography, unfortunately, doesn't let you make a decent living. Um, I came back to Serbia some five years ago, after having lived abroad, 
And I came back with the intention of pursuing documentary photography as my main career. Uh, coming back to Serbia was a financial decision, but it was also a calling I felt that I owed something, you know, not in a patriotic, silly way to my country, but I felt that I could make a difference. I myself am part of the wider LGBT family, you know, I'm a gay man, and uh, this project really helped me, it gave me a lot, it really, really, really gave me a lot. And, and once I started meeting trans people initially in Belgrade, then in Serbia, then in the region, I really felt that I could help be the vessel or, you know, the, the, the utensil that helps this, these people share their stories. Um, my interest was personal, but it was also mostly based on just the humanitarian aspect. I couldn't believe that these stories were not being told. And uh, I believe that as long as something is invisible, it's easy for the wider public to, to, to not only not understand the topic, but also to have prejudice. I think as soon as you, I always say the first goal of this project is to raise visibility, because I profoundly believe that visibility is the first step. Once you uh, acknowledge something exists, the next step is to get to know something after you have, and then it becomes personal. And I think once things become personal, it's harder to hate, to have prejudice. You know, I think this is why the concept of the project for me was really just to have a portrait per person so you can achieve the sort of mirror effect. Once you stand in front of a project, you look at the picture, whatever you think says as much about the other person as it does about you. And the idea of having the text, um, I struggled with that a lot because, as I said, I'm part of the family, but I'm not trans. And this is why I thought it was important to have the first part of the text be um, biographical, which just tells you where people are from, what they do, what they care about in their life, where they've been. But the second part, everywhere, is a direct quote from each person. And this, I felt, was extremely important because too often, almost always in the past, it's always somebody else talking about trans people. Um, so I felt that including a personal quote would allow the wider public to, to actually hear from the trans community themselves, which is the, the, the part that I felt was missing, you know? Most people haven't met a trans person, or maybe they don't know they met a trans person. This sort of was a good introduction, I felt. So once you got the concept and the idea and mm -hmm. the energy to do it, you started traveling. Yeah, actually, <laughs> yeah. Uh, initially I started, uh, I photographed friends that I had, and then through them I got to know other people from the community in Belgrade. I don't want to say that's when I realized there's a story there. I always knew there's a story there. Uh, but things needed to come together uh, financially as well. I started planning, allocating money. I first did Serbia because it was the most easily doable. And then, you know, just um, people in Serbia knew people outside of Serbia. So I slowly started reaching out to other countries. So you did it all by yourself? with money from your own pocket. Yeah, I have to say this, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, this is very, for me, very important because uh, unfortunately in Serbia, maybe here it's the same, I don't know, uh, but too often the NGO sector which works for the LGBT rights is tainted. You know, they call them their Western traitors, their propaganda from the West. I felt that to be authentic, I wanted, to, I wanted Trans Balkan to be an independent project. And I managed to do this. It was very hard financially. Sometimes I would go on a trip with 50 euros. But, uh, but yeah, that's the way I approached it. So I gotta say, when I first heard about you and your project, mm -hmm. it was through a friend activist from yes. Serbia yeah. who introduced uh, uh, yourself and mm -hmm. your project. Mm -hmm. And I have to admit that that made me uh, more comfortable to mm -hmm. 
to be open and to give access to other trans people yeah. in Romania to you and, and your camera. Yeah. That meant a lot. Mm -hmm. Because I know that this question is raised a lot. How can we give access to such vulnerable people yeah. uh, and identities to somebody who doesn't have the same life experience? For sure. How do you feel about that? Uh, I, I, from the start, I felt a very big responsibility because I'm not talking about my, myself or my most immediate group, which is why I felt it was important to give voice to the people I was photographing. Uh, Sasha Lazic is the friend yes, that connected is. us, and he is, a, he is a very wonderful young man who is an activist in Serbia, and uh, just in reaching other people in other countries, I have to say that activists Friends of mine who were activists, as in your case, helped make that bridge. Because confidence and just, you know, if somebody contacts you on Facebook, you don't know who they are, you don't know what their intentions are, you don't know what they want. So there was a lot of trust to be built. And in fact, I'm very grateful to Sasha and I'm very grateful to other friends or friends I've made along the way who helped me bridge this difference. Uh, because if somebody contacts you out of the blue, you're not likely to answer. Um, so activism and, and a lot of the young people who are present in the project are activists themselves. And I have to say they play the crucial role. Um, I think internet has changed things a lot. It has allowed the whole world to communicate, including the trans community, to have a communication going amongst themselves. And, and I certainly, trans activists have helped a lot. Because when you get somewhere that's not your country, when you don't have a lot of money, um, you know, it's important to, to go straight to the place. <laughs> to not. How long did it take to gather all these people and portraits together? Uh, some of the first portraits I did uh, date back to maybe five years ago, a few. Most of them were done within the last two years. Let's say the last year and a half, two years of my life, I've dedicated to this. Um, as I said, I also work, um, or prior to COVID, <laughs> I used to work in fashion, so that helped financially. But uh, this project, in its first phases, was definitely just a solo artistic author project. Uh, altogether, I would say the last two years. So it was a journey for yourself as well? Oh, it was uh, uh, <laughs> all the projects of my life I've done, this has been the most meaningful for sure. I feel that I, I've not only learned a lot, of course, but it has, it has changed me. It has very much changed me. It has opened my eyes. It has brought out the activist in me I didn't know was there. You know, there's, it's far from fashion to activism. There's quite a distance. But I always knew I wanted to do documentary work. I just never found a story that touched me so much, such as this one. So going through this journey mm -hmm. and being an artist, a photographer, and talking about how you've become now a sort of an activist yeah, in many for sure. ways, for sure. do you think art has an impact as activism on a political level, on a societal level, to not necessarily change things, but maybe things, challenge yeah. mentalities at least? I do, I do. As I say, initially this exhibition opened in Belgrade in February 2019. And back then I was just happy to get an exhibition in Belgrade. Uh, I was selected for a, an important gallery, which is uh, it's owned by the city. So it was the first time such a thing was being helped by the city. So I was happy with that. Back then I didn't have plans to tour the region. Um, but it's, uh, forgive me, I lost the train of thought. What about activism? How does art work? I think, that, exactly. I think for the public in Serbia, I thought the best way to approach such a topic was through art. Because through art, you really can penetrate certain circles of our community, which otherwise you wouldn't be able to touch. You know, if you tell somebody, unfortunately, come to a lecture that talks about trans rights, most people uh, might not be interested for various reasons. 
Um, I think art really allows you to more easily access people you wouldn't otherwise have access to. Especially in an area that is quite known for being hostile to trans people. Uh, absolutely. absolutely. Transphobic societies. Absolutely. Did you face any transphobic attitudes in your exhibitions during the photographing these people? I have to say that even from the start, I knew that my public, I wanted this project to be seen by people who are not part of our family, LGBT family. I'm very happy when people from our community come to the exhibitions, but my goal was to touch people who had no idea. Uh, in doing this, I was ready to face some backlash, and there has been some backlash, for sure. But honestly, what touched me the most is actually the lack of backlash. I, once, I think the project is conceived in such a way that it doesn't provocate, it doesn't exotize, it, it just informs people. And the reactions I've gotten so far really have been positive. I, if I dare say, I've been pleasantly surprised by how little hostile uh, reaction there has been to the project, which still doesn't erase the fact that we live in a region of Europe which is the most hostile to any different. This is why I'm, 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 I'm asking um, also about, this is a personal thought, mm -hmm. that do we need more provocative art projects? Do we need to step a bit further and show more and talk more and di dig deeper? into these sure. identities and life yeah. stories and uh, create maybe, I don't know, a wave of shock towards the hetero cis normativity society? Do we need that? What do I you think? I think we do, for sure. I think we do. I think that uh, for me it was important because it was a first such project in Serbia. I, very, I calculated, I really wanted it to be done in a way where I almost would erase any rational possibility for people to attack the project, you know? Because they always want to say, oh, you know, it's all sex work. I have nothing against sex work. But they want to try and put people in a box. So I created this project wanting to show the wide spectrum of what being trans is. And I felt that that was a good start. Having said this, I absolutely think there's a need to push the, the boundary and the border, for sure. In some way, your project is, because if you come closer to the portraits mm -hmm. and you read the story of the people, mm -hmm. you see there's a lot of intersectional identities yeah. with these people. Yeah. There are sex workers, there are Roma people, yeah. uh, there are migrants. Know, people who have been thrown out of their homes at an early age, For sure. who have had a hard life, young people, uh, elder people. Um, did you consider the intersectional aspect of your project from the beginning or I, did it show up along the way? No, I actually I really did. I did because I thought very hard because I felt the responsibility on my shoulder you know, once you're taking pictures, and I'm a photographer and I love taking pictures, and I love meeting people, that was good and that was fun. Once I started forming the concept, I really felt a lot of pressure. Uh, a, I didn't know as much as I know now about the trans community. B, it just, I didn't want to make a mistake, you know, because then I would do something that's counter-effective. Um, so there was a lot of pressure. The, the, my intention was really to show the wide spectrum. And from the start, I wanted to, to illustrate, because I think this helps the wider public accept that being trans touches every aspect of human community in the world. You know, there's rich people, there's poor people, there's educated people, there's young, old, there's all religions, all nationalities, and I felt that if we show this, then the viewer, who knows nothing, at least the one conclusion they can have is, huh, look, you know, it's not just sex workers, it's not just this, it really is everyone. So this was important from the start for me. And, and, you know, the youngest person 
the pictures you see here tonight, I think 24 of them, um, I wanted to bring some of the Romanian people that I photographed. Not all of them are here. The project right now consists uh, of more than 100 people from 12 countries. These are just some of them. Um, but I felt, yeah, I felt it was crucial. It was crucial to show the diversity because when you show the diversity, that also allows people to open their mind and to realize that it's not just one thing, you know. It's human stories and human portraits, and I think it's a really good start. Um, did people let you come close with your camera easily? Did they open up <laughs> easily and let you into their homes and intimacy easily? You, you did. <laughs> I, I'm used to it, yeah, but you not did, all of these wonderful. people are. No, 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 it was very hard. And uh, I have to say the farther the more it lasted, the easier it became. Because there was some trust built, maybe somebody already heard about the project or saw the exhibition somewhere. At first it was very hard. And I absolutely understand all the people who said no to me or who said, I'll meet you there and then never showed up, even though I had traveled for six hours. It was really hard at first, but I fully understand. because, And I admire all of these people I admire all the people that were in the project because it's not, hard, it's, it's not easy to accept to go public. You know this very well yourself. To go public, uh, some people are not, most people are not activists. They had never done such a thing before. And again, it's, you know, some Alexander Tsernogorac with a weird last name contacting you and asking, could you please do this? Again, Usually I would really try and get to know people before. Internet helps a lot. But yeah, it was hard at first. Rightly so. And I am. Congratulations even more now. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> so a lot of people didn't, you know, the people who didn't want to participate, I respect that. I'm just grateful for the people who decided to participate because I feel like they're really pioneers. I really do. I really, really do. Has the project reached an end? <laughs> Where is it now? Uh, the project right now numbers, as I said, more than 100 people. Um, I need to stop. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely need to stop because the idea for the book, which is the next and final step, is to have 100 trans individual stories from the Balkan region. Um, I still have a few people that I want to photograph because there's some amazing stories out there that I feel need to be part of the book. But let's say that the photographing part is almost done. Uh, yeah. So yeah. there is a book coming. The book is uh, very early on. I realized that I wanted to do the book. Um, it seemed very abstract and very impossible. I'm very grateful for the fact that the project is a regional project because I feel like that helped move things along the way. There is a book deal. Uh, the UN office in Serbia, which I'm very grateful, is going to help publish the book. And, uh, and actually this is even more surprising and I'm very grateful. The biggest Serbian government owned publishing house. Basically, Serbia. The, yeah, in Serbia. The publisher that does the books for the schools and that prints the laws for the government. Great. They, yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. They're going to print the book. And uh, if everything goes well, it's coming out on December the 10th, which is the International Human Rights yes. Day. And it will be bilingual or just in Serbia? Yeah. It will have, that, was one of my, uh, <laughs> okay. that was one of my requests, that it needs to be uh, Serbian and English. Do you have any plans for this exhibition at least, or for the book to travel across the Balkan region, maybe I, in Western Europe, uh, in the US, Asia, whatever? To be honest, my goal was to bring the exhibition everywhere where I traveled, which is the 11 countries plus Turkey. And so far, the only countries missing are uh, Slovenia and Greece. And this, there were plans to go there, but then COVID happened. So I'm not, I'm sure that will happen too. So we already visited most of the places. Uh, as I said, 
my preference was to go to a place such as this, which is not strictly LGBT. In some places such as Kosovo, where it was impossible, then we were part of the Pride organization, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, once the book comes out, I have the, I have the exhibition printed. So I'm willing to give it, share it, exhibit it anywhere. Small towns in Serbia, there's talks of maybe Temisvar. Anywhere where there's a will to host it, I will absolutely give it. Absolutely. Before we open the discussion to the public, I would like to ask for a personal story that touched you, touched mm. you with one of these people <laughs> whose intimacy you got to know. <laughs> something, anything, just as a small tribute to all the people who contributed to this exhibition. You know, it's the one thing that I don't like to do, but of course it's a, it's a reasonable question. I don't like to select anyone in specific, but what I would say is that uh, older people's stories didn't touch me more, but I found that older people who grew up in times that were even more less accepting than today. I feel that these people have really been through a lot. Again, I'm not suggesting young people here or anywhere have it easy. They absolutely do not. But um, her, Brankica. Brankica is the oldest person in the project. Uh, I met her one month before she died. She passed away. and. Uh, the circumstances under which I met her, the amount of time I spent looking for her. When I found her, she was, you know, she had broken both of her hips. The stories she told me, her journey has really, really touched me. Um, so if I have to choose, I would choose Brankica. But honestly, every person, every, every person in this layout, you know, um, Angela, she's from Albania. Um, okay, she's trans, she's Roma, she is homeless, she's a drug addict, and she's a sex worker. You know, that's five things that are very hard, and she lives in the poorest country in Europe. Um, but then, I also was very careful, and am very careful, I don't want to make, this is not a sad story, this is a survivor story. So there is, you know, like, he's a PhD student. You know, he's, he's incredible. There's, there's lots of, she was a contestant in um, X Factor, Balkan X Factor. There's also uplifting stories. There's stories of life. So, and I thought that was crucial to show. So it's not just, it's an ongoing battle, which is very hard. But I think all of these people are absolutely winners. And that's the, that's the feeling I want the audience to have when they walk away. Yeah. Thank you, Alexander. <laughs> Thank that you. was my feeling as well, you know, getting in touch with you and allowing you, you to take my photograph. I wouldn't have done it if I hadn't felt that energy, responsibility, um, uh, and professional attitude towards the project from you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now we are ready to ask anybody, whoever, if they want to address questions to Alexander um, about anything, really. <laughs> Almost. Almost, <laughs> right? Let's open up the discussion, please. We have a third microphone, which our dear volunteer can pass on. Alexa has a question. Um, okay, my question was like that. You said the people out of community came and saw the um, project, right? Mm -hmm. um, the people says, mostly in Romania, I don't know, in other countries, yeah, trans people, I know. Mm -hmm. But did you ask after, did you know that? I mean, after they saw the stories, they saw the pictures, the <coughs> reaction was same, I know. No, I, uh, thank you for that question. Okay. That's some of the most gratifying moments, the moments that make me feel really good. 
And it starts from, I don't know, I have an aunt, Zia, uh, who loves me, who accepts me as gay, but she had no idea about trans people. So it's even personal, you know, like now she knows and she's read all the stories and she's cried about the project and now she follows where it goes. So I think everybody learns something. And, and it's okay that some stories touch some people more. Um, it's also, it, it, it's a short text for everybody. So I don't presume, I don't try to say, you know, you're gonna get to know everything. You're not, but you're gonna get a good introduction. If you come with an open heart and an open mind, and you take the time to read, you're gonna learn something. Something is gonna click. You know, I say that if it's a mirror and you look and you read, you have to be a serious psychopath not to feel anything. Which of course, unfortunately, there are some. But I think most people have learned something. Yeah. If I understood the question, yeah. Somebody else. If there are other people in this room who allowed Alexander to take a photo, I want to talk about their experience. Want to talk? They are um, welcome to share it. Yeah. It's not mandatory. There are some, for sure. <laughs> and I have to say, when I came to Romania last time, I was here for three days barely, and I met... Uh, actually, Romania is the country where I managed to meet the most people out of all the countries I went. Uh, I met 12 people, which in three days, you know, for me, it was just... It was, it, then I, I came home, and as often is the case after these trips, you know, I have to sit for a day to process everything because I feel so grateful and also just lucky because in such a short amount of time you meet people they tell you their stories you take their picture you take on the responsibility um, it's yeah it's incredible and some of the Romanian people are here so <laughs> I thank them for coming any more questions I have one go do you feel there is a generational change <laughs> in attitudes of trans people towards life and generally speaking towards their identities? Um, this depending on their age, for example? If I understand correctly, within the trans community, if there's a If you feel there is a gap, not necessarily a gap, but a change within generations of trans people? For sure. For sure, I think the, again, not suggesting it's easy for the young people, but at times I've been seriously impressed by how young people, it's not that they don't care what other people think about them, everybody cares, we all care. But I think times have changed and younger people are less interested or, or, or they have more strength, maybe because they're young, and when you're young, you're naturally strong. I definitely feel that young people are less apologetic, mm -hmm. which I love, and more willing to, to push the border, you know? Yeah. I think if, if Brankica, who lived most of her life in secret, you know, I think that was her strength that made possible what's happening today the horrible thing would be if it was constant. So I definitely see, you know, it's becoming more, um, what's the word, more powerful. Yes. Definitely more powerful. I agree, actually, mm. and they are more assertive. Yeah. Uh, they know better who they are, and they are willing to fight harder for who they are in all their aspects of their lives. But personally, I'm also worried that this brings some fragility, some um, sensitivity uh, to wisdom in terms of they, how they uh, face the outside society with full openness and full heartedly, and how that can come back as a boomerang of, uh, of oppression and hatred. Uh, that's my personal fear, and this is why I feel that it's mandatory to protect 
trans youth as much as trans yeah. LGBTQIA plus people actually, uh, because as they are powerful, they are also fragile. Uh, but to conclude, I put a lot of faith and confidence in them, in their generation and their future. Um, and I also think that awareness is the one activism activity mm -hmm. that cannot stop no matter how many rights we gain over, the, over time. Uh, so we need to talk about ourselves mm -hmm. uh, with our own means or with other means mm -hmm. as, as just as uh, your project yeah. is doing. Um, questions? Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, what you said already sounded as a conclusion, but I will ask a totally different question. You said something about uh, how difficult it was to finance your project in the beginning, especially because you didn't want to apply for funds at the LGBT community, so did it did I understand it correctly? To, to be honest, uh, in Serbia, there isn't really a big <laughs> offering of places where you can apply to do such a project. Nothing against my own country, I don't know yeah. the situation here, but there aren't so many funds. Uh, I didn't want to get, I felt, I didn't want to get stigmatized, you know, like this is Western propaganda or this is, you know, America paid for this because they want to make Serbia, all of Serbia, LGBT, whatever. That's so, what I wanted to ask. How was your project uh, seen by the LGBT communities in Serbia? Because um, there are a few, as I understood. Yeah, I'm very, very friendly uh, with all of the LGBT I'm friends with all of those organizations and I cooperate with all of them. I just felt that it was important for the wider public to be coming to see an exhibition by an independent author. So they couldn't say, oh, there's an agenda behind there. You know, in the future, of course, it would have made my life much easier if I had help, like now I do for the book. Obviously, I couldn't finance the book myself. But in the beginning, I felt that to attract people, mm, it was more effective for it to be an independent project. Yeah. I can also ask one more question. Did you also show the exhibition in schools? Uh, no, not yet. Uh, the cool thing about the exhibition in Belgrade is um, it was, um, it's called Dom Omladine. It's an old communist inherited gallery in the center of town, which is very frequented. So the exhibition was there for like three weeks. I would go not every day, but almost every day to stop by, see if there's people, and there was always people. After the exhibition finished, they told me from the institution, this was the most visited exhibition in four years. So that says something, there's an interest there. Uh, I've been contacted by a professor at the Belgrade University, if I'm not wrong, of psychology, who says that she brought her students, and when I was in Macedonia, there was a teacher who brought her students. Um, I myself haven't had contact with the Ministry of Education, but as I said, my plan absolutely is, after having visited the capitals, in Serbia everything happens in Belgrade. I think Romania is a little better. Uh, there's other towns, but my plan and intention really is to give it to any institution who is willing to show it. Absolutely. And there will be, um, I bought a site, <laughs> transbalkan.eu, and it needs to be online as well. Yeah, absolutely. Because, I mean, not just because of COVID, but young people live online, and there needs to be a, pre you know, online presence for sure. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Joanna? Uh. Yeah, okay. Okay. I'm just curious if you traveled alone or with someone. Do you have a small team or how was this going? I wish. <laughs> no, actually, I don't wish. I like uh, working alone, uh, but I traveled alone uh, in initially because of finances. Um, because that just would have been an additional cost. 
and you know, I interview the people, I photograph the people, so they're, you know, most, not mostly, always alone. Um, and then I would meet people locally, such as Patrick, who would help me connect with other people. But yeah, it was a completely solo. It was really a self-discovery as well uh, for me. So yeah, I was alone. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes. Hello. Hi. We know many trans people mm -hmm. are very self-conscious about their bodies. So how did you, as a photographer, tackle that issue and make them feel beautiful and accepted? Because it's hard to talk to a person when you are self-conscious about yourself rather than being in front of a camera. Thank you very much for asking this. Thank you so much. Uh, when the Belgrade exhibition happened, Sasha Lazic, who is the gentleman who connected us, came up to me after the exhibition was a success and he said, you don't even understand what you managed to do. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, you photographed, back then it was 34 people. He said, you photographed 34 people and all of them are happy with their picture. Do you know how hard this is for trans people? Um, at first, I wasn't aware. I wasn't concentrated on this. Nevertheless, I have to say that even though some of the pictures are posed, I always give the person a choice of how they want to be photographed. Whether it's from a distance, whether it's a full body, whether it's just face. So it's always an agreement. Or, or in 98% of the times it was or I would choose the top five pictures and then together with the person select which one they like. But to answer your question directly, uh, at first I was not aware. It, I was aware, but the focus was not so much on that. The more I became aware of this, the bigger pressure it, it put on me. But from the start, I always wanted to collaborate with people to create a, a, a portrait. You know, there were some people who knew exactly what they wanted, how they wanted. Um, other people were completely okay and open. But then again, they would get to see the final pictures and, and usually choose. Yeah. But I would like to add a note on yeah, this, do, which do. is amazing <laughs> what you did, absolutely. But we have to be aware that most of these people are far advanced into their medical transition who is by default the one who um, uh, alleviates dysphoria, gender dysphoria. So uh, m maybe a future challenge, no pressure, what to see uh, into those people who are okay with their identity, who want to manifest it publicly, want to show themselves, but don't yet have access to med proper medical support. Cherkica, right here, she is the only, she says, but it's true, she's the only openly trans woman in Kosovo. She's Roma, she doesn't work, doesn't have where to live. Um, absolutely no medical, psychological access to any kind of help. Um, she doesn't even, she doesn't even dream of hormone therapy because yeah. she knows she cannot reach it, you know? So with people like this, I just felt that it was important to let her show herself the way she felt most comfortable. That is a very strong photo, I have to agree. I, and in her story, in her quote, she says, all I want in life is a roof over my head. Yeah. That's it, to have that security. Yeah. Uh, that's very powerful. Mm. Um, you know, so, yes, thank you for that. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Ad Adina? Uh -huh. um, I've been winning. Uh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Emotions. I've been meaning to ask actually mm -hmm. about your struggles with this project, and I don't mean the. Mm, what I mean is <laughs> that uh, I'm thinking it must have been a lot emotionally, psychologically yeah. and everything. And I wanted to ask, uh, what did you learn about yourself in the process? 
Thank you. Uh, it was very, I consider myself, I know I'm, I'm pretty emo emotional, but uh, I learned along the way that when I'm working, I'm working, and I have to be present, and I have to at least give the person on the other side a sense of confidence and calm, but I definitely, numerous times coming home from a trip, you know, from tears are the least. Um, you know, after certain meetings, it takes, a, it takes a period of time to get back to breathing again normally. Um, I don't want to single anybody out, but it, it's a lot that you take on. Uh, there's guilt as well because then I get to go home and you know I have my security and safety so it was it was very emotionally empowering but also very draining um, I'm happy now because I know there will be a book and I feel like I have helped do something and that that feeds me but numerous times I felt broken I felt you know, again, with Cherkitsa, she was, at, we were together when she was attacked. You know, she wasn't physically attacked, but she was spat on. We were sitting in a cafe, having coffee in Pristina, and uh, I just heard noise, people speaking, men came up, they were sh telling, I, I don't know if she knows them, she it finished that they spat on her. Not one person, like, Five men were there. I don't know how many, they just spit on her. You know, this, you can't go home, I mean, you know, like this just, it still now moves me, no, no, moves me, it terrorizes me. It terrorizes me, but then I think about her and how she doesn't give up. And then that gives me strength. So in a selfish way, to be honest, I feel I got way more than I gave with all of this. I mean, I was an okay person to start with, but I really feel that, like, there's no comparison. There's no, and, and I think that's what's important for people to go out of their own bubble and to see how other people live. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Thank you. Uh, my daughter just told me my question without a talk before. You have a it's good okay. daughter. Yeah, <laughs> no, she didn't know what I was. Yeah. Anyway, this, that was my question also. How did you manage your feelings after all the stories you got? And now what I wanted to say after uh, my daughter asked, it's you really did, I think you still don't realize how much did you did. I just realize now what situation are in other parts of the world. I mean, she died. She's fighting alone. I mean, how happy I am meeting those people, having them near me. I mean, I, I have a reason to. I, I have no words. <laughs> I have to be honest, well, even you yourself are quite an example of what strength is for me. Yeah. For me, absolutely, you are. Um, this is very personal, but. At this point in my life, I'm in a, a very stable and, and, and healthy emotional place. Uh, and I think that helped. That helped because I have a wonderful boyfriend who supports me and who helps me, who's emotionally very stable. So when I would come home, you know, completely devastated, I had somebody to talk to to help me digest. For sure, um, for sure. Thank you for saying this. Mm, Acknowledging true. privilege, it's really quite ah. important and mm. great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anybody else? <laughs> so if not, we are still here <laughs> for at least another half an hour or hour. Some of us smoke, so we will be going directly outside, <laughs> and we can continue the conversation. And I'm sorry, I just want to thank everybody who's here tonight. I really appreciate you coming out. I know that COVID is going crazy. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you.
That's it. Thank you.